Welcome into Locked On Phillies. The Phils make a flurry of moves to prepare for some new arrivals from the trade deadline. We'll break it down on today's Locked On Phillies. You are Locked On Phillies, your daily Philadelphia Phillies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, this is Lock on Phillies. I'm your host, Connor Thomas. I've been talking Phil's baseball for years over on 97.5 The Fanatic on the radio. Might have seen me on NBC Sports Philadelphia on the TV. And uh, happy to be here with you as your host of Lock on Phillies. I want to thank you for making Lock on Phillies your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Got my tank top on, just got in from the pool. And uh, it's a hot one out there in Philadelphia, so I a uh, high-temperature game tonight between the Phillies and the Washington Nationals. The next segment we got, we're going to break down everything going on in tonight's game. But the first thing I want to talk about is the uh, the current thing that popped up today that we're going to be talking about pre-game with the Philadelphia Phillies. Now, we knew that Noah Syndergaard was going to make his first start as a Philadelphia Philly tonight. We knew that Brandon Marsh was going to make his first start in center field tonight for the Philadelphia Phillies. We have a lineup. We will go over that in the second segment. Uh, and everything there and how that stacked up. But we knew what that meant, too, was that there are roster moves coming. Gene Segura was going to be back and active for tonight's game. We knew that was going to happen. So, well, the Phillies needed to make some tough moves to make space on the roster. Here's what they ended up doing. So the Phillies announced the following transactions. This is per the Phillies' official Twitter account. Center fielder Brandon Marsh and right-handed pitcher Noah Syndergaard have reported to the club. Knew that was coming. No surprise there. Great news. Syndergaard makes the start tonight. Brandon Marsh, I'm sure, will make the start in center field. Gene Segura, infielder, has been reinstated from the 60-day injured list. Segura is officially back. That's great news for the Philadelphia Phillies. He automatically becomes their best, uh, yeah, their best all-around infielder because he's going to be good at the plate. He's going to show a little bit of power. He's a much better fielder than Boehm and Reese. Even though Boehm's been on fire, his glove is a, a negative still, and Reese's glove is a negative and he's streaky. Both those guys, neither of those guys are bad players, Boehm and Reese. And Stott is not a bad player either. He's a guy that's just young. He'll get into his own. But Gene Segura, I think, is your best all-around infielder. He is now back with the team. Right-hand pitcher Kyle Gibson also has been activated from the bereavement list. Gibson comes back after missing some time after a death in the family. So glad to have Kyle Gibson back and available for this team. He will make his next start. Here's the corresponding move, though. The Philadelphia Phillies have released infielder Didi Gregorius. So we knew that there was an infield backup with the signing of Edmund, or the trading, rather, for Edmundo Sosa with Gene Segura coming back. People asking, well, why didn't they send Sosa down? Edmundo Sosa does not have an option, meaning he cannot be set to the minor leagues. He just doesn't have an option available. I guess Jairo Munoz is a guy that the Phillies wanted to keep up for depth. They trust him more for whatever reason. And uh, Johan Camargo already down in the minor leagues, already been sent down. So that left Didi Gregorius as the odd man out. Now, I thought Didi was going to hang around for the remainder of the season. I knew, though, that this was the ending of his time in Philadelphia because he was not going to be re-signed. He had an expiring contract. The Phillies were definitely going to move on at the end of this year. I didn't think it would be coming so soon. So, great news the center guard's here. Great news he'll start. Great news that Brandon Marsh is here. Great news he'll start tonight. Great news that Gene Segura is active. Great news that Gene Segura will start tonight. And great news that Kyle Gibson is back and he will make his next start. It means the Phillies are at full strength besides Two players, Zach Eflin, who's been replaced by Noah Syndergaard, so you're good there. And Bryce Harper, who we're still waiting to see probably about three weeks away as he rehabs his injured thumb that he got the pins taken out of. So all of that is positive. And the Didi Gregorius move, it is the smart move. It's a good move by Dave Dombrowski. Didi wasn't giving you much at the plate, if anything. His defense had come along nicely. He made some great defensive plays. But all in all, he wasn't bringing – all that much to this ball club, and he wasn't a very versatile defender. So he, he's a guy that he's a left-handed bat, wasn't hitting well, he was fielding well, but you got to back up at his position. It, it was it was the right move, and here's why I'm sound like I'm kind of conflicted. And Didi Gregorius, even for the times his lack of production that he had in Philadelphia, and he had some very very cold spots. 
He also had some really hot stretches back in 2020, early in 2021. <sighs> the thing with Didi Gregorius is I just like he, he's a all-around great person. He's a good guy. He's a wonderful teammate. He's always smiling. He's incredibly talented. Like the guy is knighted for goodness sake. Just a, a class act, one of those guys you want to have around your locker room. Now, Andrew McCutcheon was more productive in his time here in Philadelphia than Didi Gregorius was in his time in Philadelphia. But I see them as similar influences in the locker room. Just guys that you love to be around who are never going to cause problems, never going to get in an argument, never going to see them doing things the wrong way as far as hustle, as far as effort. They made like mental mistakes, and Didi made his share of those when he was here in the field. I think back to a series against the Cardinals, I believe it was, where he just ate a tailor-made double play instead of trying to turn it because he forgot how many outs there are. Like, yeah, that stuff is unacceptable at the major league level, but it wasn't for a lack of effort or anything like that. Didi gave this team what he had, and even though it wasn't as much as we wished he would have given at points, and this is the right move, and I'm not saying, man, he should still be here. It just sucks to see a guy like that go. It's the same thing as when Kutch left. Like Andrew McCutcheon was a guy that you weren't going to resign because of the money you command at the point in his career, he just wasn't going to be a factor on this team. And you replace him with a guy like Kyle Schwarber, your team is better for that. But it's a guy that you can't help but root for. He's a likable guy. He's never had any off-the-field issues. He does great work in the community. Like All of this stuff is true of Didi Gregorius, and that's why it sucks to see him go. He's one of those guys that when you'd see him in the in a clubhouse, you can't help but just be happy around him. His teammates seem to feel the same way. And he's just a consummate professional, a veteran guy that brought that to the locker room. And it's not like he's unreplaceable, but when you have good people as part of your organization, and for whatever reason you have to let those good people go, that hurts a little bit. I enjoyed watching him play defense. I enjoyed his good at bats at the plate. And even when he struggled, he was a guy that I couldn't help but root for because he was a guy that was easy to root for. So still wishing the best to Didi Gregorius. I'd imagine he's going to get picked up shortly by some team. Now, is it a contending team? I don't know. Maybe it's a rebuilding team that just wants to bring in a guy and see if he's got anything left and see if they want to sign him to a deal after this year. But uh, I, either way, whatever ends up being the case with Didi Gregorius, always going to wish him all the best going to remember his time here in Philadelphia fondly, even if his production isn't what we wanted it to be. And no ill will at all towards D.D. Gregorius. Is this team better off now than they were when he was the guy in the middle of the infield? Yeah, they are. And that's good work on Dave Dombrowski, and that's the nature of D.D. Gregorius aging out of being in his prime. But again, it kind of sucks to see him go. A little bit sad about that, but a necessary thing. It's like uh, I'm trying to think of a good comparison. Like you, you know, with the Eagles, if they have like a, a third string quarterback that's just a really nice guy that doesn't really bring all that much to the team. And I'm, I'm Nate Sudfeld was not this guy because we don't know what he was in the locker room, not enough. But it's that backup that you want to root for that goes somewhere else. T.J. McConnell is a great example. We all know that T.J. McConnell is not a starting player on a championship team when it comes to basketball, if you follow basketball. He's going to go and get paid somewhere else, or he's going to go get the opportunity to play for like a lesser team. And you're better off with the guys that you have now, but he's a guy that you like to have around. You can't help but root for him because he's a great guy, uh, does the little things well. That's what D.D. Gregorius is, and the team's better off with these moves. It was necessary. There's no way around it. Just – need to give and show the respect to D.D. Gregorius. A lot of people get caught up in what he was this year, which was a lack of production, another injury, not leaving the yard as far as power-wise, and not really doing the average either. But truly what D.D. Gregorius was, was a veteran that helped this team just take another step closer to the playoffs. They, they Not a big a step as we wanted them to take. We would have wished they would have made the playoffs in 2020 and 2021 as well. But one of those launching pad players, it's like, okay, he, he wasn't those terrible teams of 16, 17, 18. Like, no, this is a guy that competed, didn't give you as much as you wanted, but uh, did what he could while he was here. So respect to Didi Gregorius. Shout out to him for his time here. Wishing him all the best. And more so, 
even excited, even more excited about the guys that you have coming in here, taking his roster spot. Noah Syndergaard, Brandon Marsh, uh, Gene Segura, Kyle Gibson coming back. The Phillies are a better team for it. And we thank Gene for his contributions to the Phillies over the past couple seasons. He will be missed by a lot of people. That's all of my thoughts on that, though. And now we move on to the post Edie Gregorius Philadelphia Phillies, a better version of the Philadelphia Phillies, it looks like. And we get our first look at some new guys tonight. Coming up next, I'm going to talk you through that. We'll talk you through a lineup and some things to look for from your new face Phillies in today's game with the Washington Nationals. All of that coming up next on Locked On Phillies. All right, you know I got to tell you about my friends over at Blue Nile. You might be ready to pop the question, or maybe you're just looking for a milestone moment that you're celebrating, getting some fine jewelry for that. Well, you can find jewelry as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. They've got simple online tools to help you pick out the diamond shape, size, clarity, setting style, all of that stuff. So their bench jewelers can create your perfect, unique engagement ring. She's going to love it. It's one of a kind. Who doesn't love one of a kind stuff? Maybe you're looking for fine jewelry, but you're having trouble choosing. Well, Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7 that are available via phone or web chat to help you pick out anything you want at any budget. They'll make it work for you. Earrings, necklaces, bracelets, anklets. They'll help you with all of that stuff. And you can make your moment sparkle with jewelry from fine uh, from blue, fine jewelry from Blue Nile Jewelers. Let me get through that. And the best part, though, who doesn't love a good sale, right? Right now, Blue Nile is having their anniversary sale. So you can save up to 40% on classic fine jewelry pieces and 25% on engagement ring settings. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives at discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. So shop stress-free and find your forever piece. Go to BlueNile.com today. All right, it's Throwback Thursday down at the yard as I drop my phone all over the place. Not throw your phone Thursday, Throwback Thursday, which means the Phillies are going to be wearing their powder blues. And honestly, I'm even more excited that we're going to see Noah Syndergaard and Brandon Marsh in powder blue Phillies jerseys for their first time out. Oh, man, that's just, it's got to be a win, right? It's got to be a great game tonight. Well, here's how the Philadelphia Phillies are going to line up with some new faces, some old faces returning. I'm so excited for this. Sorry about that. My phone volume clicked on when I threw it across the room there a second ago. And this is exactly how I told you it would happen. I told you they're going to keep Kyle Schwarber in the leadoff spot. I told you they're going to start Gene Segura lower. I told you they're going to uh, bat Brandon Marsh down at the bottom of the lineup. I didn't get it 100% right, but here's how the lineup sets up today. Kyle Schwarber leading off. Reese Hoskins, Batting second, playing first base. Alec Bohm, batting third, playing third. JT Romuto, batting cleanup, playing catcher. Nick Castellanos, right field, batting fifth. Derek Hall, designated hitting, batting sixth. Gene Segura, batting seventh. That's a temporary thing. They're going to let him work his way back. I imagine he's going to end up in the two hole when everything's all said and done. But this is what I told you. He's going to take some time to work back, start him lower in the lineup, let him get some time in down there, seeing some easier pitching. Bryson Stott playing shortstop, which I also said was going to happen. Gene Segura at second. Bryson Stott at shortstop. That's how we're going to see the majority of the lineups look. That's how it's going to read the rest of the way through the season. And then Brandon Marsh makes his debut, batting ninth, playing center field. I don't care if he goes 0 for 4 or 0 for 5 tonight. I don't think he will, but I don't care if he does. I want to see what he does defensively. He has time to work his way up at the dish and let Kevin Long, the Phillies hitting coach, get some time with him. I'm not worried about the first two weeks or so of Brandon Marsh's time here at in the Phillies uniform at Citizens Bank Park or on the road, whatever the case may be. I don't care what he does at the dish. Give him two weeks, let Kevin Long work with some stuff, and then see if we see some progress over his time here in Philadelphia. And we may not even see too much progress this season. we got to prepare ourselves for that with him. 24 years old. It takes time to make these adjustments. And for some players, it's hard to make the adjustments over the course of the season. The big jump I'd imagine for Marsh, if we see one, is going to be from this season to next with a full offseason hitting program, things to work on from Kevin Long. So we may see minor adjustments throughout this season, but he's not here for his offense. He's here to lock down center field defensively. He's here to use his speed on the base pass. He's here to occasionally get on and set the table for Kyle Schwarber, who's going to be batting leadoff, and he makes your team all around better. So you've got Brandon Marsh there batting ninth, 
playing center field, and Noah Syndergaard gets to start. I'm so excited to see Noah Syndergaard start in the Powder Blues at home against the Washington Nationals. It's a game the Phillies should absolutely take care of business in. We're going to talk a little bit about the preview. He'll face off against Paolo Espino, who we told you about yesterday. If you want to watch yesterday's episode, we preview this series with the Washington Nationals, as well as recapping Nick Castellanos' heroics down in Atlanta. But this is a team Noah Syndergaard should handle. It's a team, at least the uniform looks familiar to him. Spent all that time in New York with the Mets. He's been in the division, so the Nationals are a familiar opponent. They're going to look a lot different because no Juan Soto, no Josh Bell. Obviously, Trey Turner is gone since Noah Syndergaard left the division. A bunch of other guys. Bryce Harper is gone since Syndergaard left the division. Now he's going to be a teammate of his when he's back and healthy. But there's something about, hey, I've seen this team before. I've seen this uniform. I know some of these guys. I know how this organization likes to handle their business. And there's a comfortability for facing teams that you've spent a lot of time facing in the past, even if the players aren't the same. There's certain jerseys that there's a mental thing for some guys. You know how we went through that long stretch where the Phillies just absolutely couldn't beat the Marlins, regardless of what players the Marlins trotted out there? Yeah, part of that is mental. Seeing that uniform, there's just some weird like boogeyman effect that goes the other way. If you have a team that you've had success against in the past, it doesn't matter who they're pitching or who you're facing at the plate. Well, you could have success based on just your mentality, knowing, man, I've hit Nationals pitching really well, or man, I've dominated Nationals batters really well for years now. Good to see them. I feel comfortable out here. So maybe that's the case. And Syndergaard, when he was in New York with the Mets, always handled the division pretty well. He's having a solid year, and he's had a good amount of rest since making his last start with the Angels. So should be rest, should be healthy, should be ready to go. Very excited to see what he does on the bump. Here's my prediction for one. I, I don't know. I'm not going to say I have a crystal ball. Here's what I'd like to see and what I'm expecting to see from Noah Syndergaard. I want to see five plus innings. I don't know that they'll really stretch him out because giving him some time to work that elbow out. He's been pitching on a lot of long rest this year because he's coming off that Tommy John surgery that he had. And now he's healthy, but he's the, the idea is to be cautious. You don't want to blow him out the first start you get him. So five plus innings would be great. Less than five hits, so less than a hit an inning would be great. Uh, less than three runs given up. So if he goes five and a third with four hits and two earned runs, I'm very happy with that performance. I'm great with that. I don't care that it's the Nationals. I just need to see that he comes out here, handles his business. You don't have to do anything special as well against the Nationals to win games. The Phillies' offense should be dominant tonight. The Phillies' defense should be dominant tonight. They should dominate this team tonight. So you go out, a lot of emotion pumping for the Phillies. This is also one of those games where, you know, you played the Blue Jays up in Toronto, and they fired their manager, and then you see them the next day, and they come out and they trounce you. Uh, you just saw it with the first game in Atlanta. Sign Austin Riley, a huge locker room presence for them, the, one of the faces of their franchise. He gets his big deal. The Braves are all in his press conference, and then, well, they come out and they throttle the Phillies 13-1. to Emotions like that play into a game, and the Nationals, well, emotions have never been lower for them, never been higher emotions for the Phillies this year. Well, maybe besides Rob Thompson's first stretch as manager when they fired Joe Girardi, but this is another one with momentum will play. The Nationals have nothing to play for. The Phillies are on a hot stretch and chasing down their first playoff berth in a decade. Yeah, this is going to be a fun game. So make sure you tune in tonight, 7.05 first pitch at Citizens Bank Park. That is going to be great. And coming up next when we wrap up and we get into our final segment of Locked On Phillies, I'm going to tell you the expectations for Brandon Marsh and Gene Segura, the two position players, as far as what I'm looking for for them tonight at the dish. That'll be our final segment on today's Locked On Phillies. All right, I want to tell you my friends about my friends over at Built Bar, and they just sent me some of these. I can't wait to try them, the cookie dough chunk puffs. But if you haven't tried Built Bar puffs yet, you're depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. They're protein-infused marshmallows covered with 100% real chocolate. And this new favorite, uh, flavor, I love cookie dough. I can't get enough of it. It's cookie dough. It's for me. That's how I see it. But normal cookie dough, man, I, I'm trying to stay in shape. It's not good for you. This cookie dough... This flavoring in a marshmallow package, well, 160 calories, 15 grams of protein, and it's collagen protein, which absorbs better into your body. Your body can use it easier. 
Oh man, that's so good. I can't wait to dive into those and try. You shouldn't wait. You got to go ahead and check out the new cookie dough chunk puffs before they run out. So head over to built.com, use promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. All right, so let's talk about the new guys, Brandon Marsh and Gene Segura, and what I'm looking for in tonight's game to really have some uh, confidence in them going forward. Gene Segura, I just want to see his contact and the power behind his contact. He could get out four times, but if he barrels a couple balls up and hits them hard, that's the more important thing to me. I want him to look comfortable at the plate. I trust in the field he's going to be fine. The fielding comes back much easier than the hitting because the, the fielding is low impact. The fielding is low stress. Like, yeah, you might have to lay out or stuff, but that's all lower body. The fact that it's a finger injury that he's coming back from, the fielding shouldn't be an issue. The throwing shouldn't be an issue. You don't really have that much impact. Do I have a baseball around here? I don't know what I did with the baseball that I normally have, but you're not heavily impacting your hand when you grab the ball out of your glove and throw it. Or when you catch with the glove, it's in the pocket. It's not really hitting your hand. So he should be fine fielding-wise. I want to make sure that he doesn't have any like grimacing at the plate. I want to see his timing. But more importantly, I want to see the swing speed, the exit velocity, the barrel. If he can hit the ball hard, that means that he really he trusts his grip strength. He trusts his ability with his hands to get the bat through the zone, which you're using your fingers as part of the fulcrum that swings the bat through. So that's an important part to see how much he trusts his hands. And that's what I'm looking at for Gene Segura. I don't care if he gets out every time. I want to see hard hit balls. I want to see him look comfortable when he's swinging. Brandon Marsh, uh, I don't want to say it's the opposite because I'm not really looking for a certain number of hits from him, him either. I do need him to get a hit tonight. I'd like to see him get on base in his first game, not because I need to see it, but because this fan base has already been fed the information on Brandon Marsh that he's not really a major league hitter yet. Okay, well, as positive as we are right now, this fan base can certainly develop an opinion of a player early. That's kind of what we do here in Philly. And the last thing we need is him to come out and go like, oh, for his first 12 as a Philly. And all of a sudden, yeah, the fan base buys into the fact that he'll never be a major league hitter which is not the case, and it won't matter even if he starts 0 for 12. But I need Brandon Marsh to get a hit tonight in his first game to kind of quell the concerns of the fan base and the people following this team saying that, okay, we don't know what he's giving you at the dish. That doesn't mean he's going to be a player. Like, tonight will not determine his career with the Phillies. I think putting the fan base at ease, though, is a big step for him. In the field, uh, he's going to be great. That fielding just doesn't slump. You kind of always have it. So he'll, he'll be good. Knowing a new ballpark, I don't know that he's ever played at Citizens Bank Park in his career. The Angels were here earlier this year, so I'd imagine he played in those games. I'm trying to remember back, but a newer ballpark, he'll have to get used to that out there in center field. I'm sure he'll be doing that during BP and everything there. He may have even been over here the past couple of days while the team was in Atlanta working on stuff like that, but I'll be interested to see how he roams the outfield and interacts with his corner outfield guys, Castellanos and Schwarber. And then at the plate, the other thing I want to see, not so much at the plate, but when he gets on base, the aggressiveness on the base paths. He's very fast. He likes to turn singles into doubles. That'll be a big thing. And one other thing for Brandon Marsh, while we're piling stuff on his plate, just the young 24-year-old who has now the pressure of being with an organization competing for the playoffs as opposed to the Los Angeles Angels, his approach at the plate, how he sees the ball, how he sees pitches, bad hitters, or below average hitters, we'll say, because he is a below average major league hitter right now. Below average hitters can turn into average hitters by just having a great approach at the plate, seeing a lot of pitches. It helps you when you're slumping, because even if you can't make contact sometimes, it seems like you got a hole in your bat. Well, being able to command the strike zone as a hitter is a big stretch to remedying that. So his approach at the plate will also be interesting to me. But it's going to be a fun game. New faces are always fun. It feels like opening day all over again. And the new look Philadelphia Phillies will be in action tonight with a very winnable game against the Washington Nationals. I cannot wait. So I'm going to go get ready. That's all I've got for you for today's Locked On Phillies. I want to thank you for making Locked On Phillies your first listen every day. Make your second listen Locked On MLB. Paul Francis Sullivan, make sure you call him Sully. He knows baseball inside and out. 
He's covering the big stories from around the league. And while the Phillies were busy at the trade deadline, they were not the only ones. A lot of great stuff going on around baseball. So check out Sully's podcast, Locked on MLB. It's available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. That's all I've got for you for today. Thank you for listening, rating, reviewing, subscribing, all of that good stuff you do to help us out here at Locked on Phillies. And uh, hopefully the Phillies get a win tonight. I will talk to you all tomorrow.